You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Wanda Marie Miller. Well, happy spring, everybody, and welcome to the Author Stories Podcast. Uh, if you go to HankGarner.com, we've got a, a new site design. I think you're going to like it. It's easier to dig through all the archives of the show. And as always, uh, there's a, a little search box on the right-hand side and a, uh, a box where you can sort them uh, in a long list and you can find an author interview that you like. Also, subscribe to the show. There are buttons over there in the right-hand uh, sidebar as well. If you would like to support the show, there is a link in the right-hand sidebar where you can donate to the show. If you'd like to drop something in the Author Stories tip jar, there's also a link in the top sidebar where if you would like to advertise your product or service in the show, you can do that as well. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, please click on the Amazon links in the show notes and support the authors that come on, and uh, we do appreciate it. After our great author interview today, stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Hey authors, you need an editor in your life. And not just an editor, but an editor that understands you and gets what you're trying to accomplish. That's why you need to visit my good friend Scott Woodley at MarloMoss.net and let him take a look at your work. He'll give you a free sample edit. Scott can help you Be the best writer you can be. Visit him at MarloMoss.net. Inspired sentences and polished paragraphs for print-worthy books at competitive rates and always on time. Offering a full range of editorial and ghostwriting services to self-published and traditionally published authors. Turn your ideas into words and see your dreams become books. I'd also like to tell you about a new sponsor, George Kramer and his new book, Blind to Blood. Ben Bergstow had a unique job. He was a tissue procurement specialist. When someone died, he would surgically remove people's body parts for donation. He really enjoyed doing it. So much so, when an anonymous email asked him to consider recovering people's body parts on the side, he was more than happy to oblige. The trouble was Ben sought out live people to fulfill his clandestine client's needs. Read all about Ben's exploits in this riveting book that delves into tissue procurement, Blind to Blood by George Kramer. Pick up your copy today on Amazon and find out why people are saying this is an intense page turner, uh, that they are also fascinated by digging into the mind of Ben and finding out how he works. If you would like to see a look into the darker side of humanity, pick up Blind to Blood, the riveting new page turner by George Kramer. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, my uh, my guest is Wanda Marine Miller, and she has a fantastic new book out called Last Trip Home. It's out now uh, everywhere that you buy books, so go uh, run and pick up a copy of Last Trip Home. Uh, Welcome to the show, Mo. How are you? I'm a little nervous, as I told you, but I'm living, and that's always a good sign, and thank you for helping me pimp my book. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we um, uh, we begin each show with the same question, uh, but we're going to delay that question for just a minute, uh, because you, uh, you have a, a blog that you want to share with us before we get into the actual interview. Yes, it's on my website, lasttriphome.wordpress.com. And the reason I wanted to read it is so that if I forget things, uh, and I will, uh, or look like a fool, uh, this will help excuse me and maybe people will feel sympathetic for me. Uh, so my latest blog is Alzheimer's and Dick Picks. I've had major slippage lately supporting my fear slash belief that I have Alzheimer's as my mother did. I keep trying to reassure myself that my mother had it in her late 50s and that I will be 78 this year. And didn't I say that in an earlier blog? I forget. I tell myself that the slippage is caused by book stress 
that once I'm no longer expected to pimp my book, I will relax and remember what I went into another room to get, or whether I took my arthritis pill, or what I wore the last time I did something important. I have a friend who keeps a chart on her refrigerator of what she wore on important occasions. My friends lie and say I don't have Alzheimer's. They brag about their own memory lapses. How does that help me if they have it too? I tell them I started out smarter than they did, so mine is not as noticeable. If I have Alzheimer's, I have selective memory. I remember negative experiences that prove I have it. I admit negativity is my nature. My slight advantage is that I'm a writer, so I can put the experiences in a blog and pimp my book. Last Trip Home, available now on Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble. My most recent example of forgetfulness happened a couple of Sundays ago when my old dude and I were watching the Bill Maher show and saw that Elliot Spitzer was a guest. Isn't that Uma Abedin's husband? I asked O.D., I was thinking of the New York congressman whose career was short because of a dick pic on Twitter and for sending obscene material to a minor. No, he said. What's his name? Spitzer is the one designed governor of New York because of prostitution scandals. Who is it? Huma Abedin. She was Hillary Clinton's right-hand woman, I said impatiently. But what the hell was her husband's name? He had a funny name. It had something to do with dicks. Picker, maybe. I had to Google Huma Abedin to find out her husband's name. Anthony Weiner, I told O.D. How much more obvious can it be? Weiner, who had dick pics. We had a companionable but laugh. Then... A few days later, we were visiting an older, wealthy couple and tried to tell the Dick Dick story to them. We forgot Wiener's name again. They couldn't remember it either. Our friends had three younger employees nearby in the kitchen preparing lunch for us. Anthony Wiener, yelled one of them. Of course. Anthony Anthony Wiener. His name became my mantra for free, the frequent times I have trouble remembering something. Wiener Dick, Wiener Dick. Saying it does not help me remember, but it comforts me. So thank you for letting me read my excuse in advance for getting things and saying my mantra <laughs> to comfort me. <laughs> and that's at your website, uh, lasttriphome.wordpress.com, right? Excellent. Uh, well, yes, Mo, good memory. Uh, Obviously, yeah. you don't have it. <laughs> well, not yet. Let's let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> um, well, Mo, we begin each uh, show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, I started writing in the third grade uh, because. Reading was my escape. I loved, loved stories, and it opened me up to a world I'd never seen. So I wrote a story in class based on one I had read. I didn't know I was plagiarizing and put it on the teacher's desk, and she read it, and she seemed pleased with me. Uh, But it was offset by my cousin, who I, whom I based uh, Marley Jean on, that character on, or partly. Uh, she's a composite character. And she uh, took the book I had been reading and based the story on up to the teacher and said, this is where she got that story. And uh, that, uh, that took a little of the pleasure out of it. But I certainly learned not to plagiarize then. So I started writing then, and uh, it was always my dream to write stories. And then, I don't know, maybe in the 80s, I started writing my own stories. Cause, uh, and I wrote pretty much every story I remember. I have thousands and thousands of pages. It was difficult to pare it down to this book, Last Trip Home. And I finally focused 
almost solely on the Arkansas part because I realized that was more unusual. So I have a modern framework in California where I live. Uh, and then in the middle, it's uh, the, mostly the Arkansas story and going back to Arkansas to try to help my female relatives. Uh, I, I like what you, uh, you you talked about just a minute ago about learning to write and, and starting by plagiarizing uh, until you found your own words. Uh, I think that's a... Yes. I, I think that's a pretty common experience for a lot of writers because oh, really? you you um uh you know you don't know how to write until you start writing and sometimes you you need someone else's words to to help you get started <laughs> not that we publish those things but as as a writing exercise and as a um a, a way to to figure out how people do it you know using someone else's words is a great way to to do that oh thank you that makes me feel less guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this story takes place in Arkansas. Well, like you said, it's got the, the dual framework there. Uh, but you were originally from there, aren't you? Yes, yes. Born and raised there. I didn't leave until maybe maybe totally my late 20s. I'd lived in a couple of other places as an adult after I married. But uh, uh, but I ser- all my formative years were in Arkansas. I'm I'm always really interested to see how uh, the places that we were raised in and where we come from uh, seem to affect uh, the types of stories that we tell or the kinds of characters that we paint. Uh, is there anything uh, very specifically Arkansas that you feel like uh, influences the the way you write or the way that you um, portray characters? Uh, well, the, the life I lived, I started out in a three room sharecropper shack that belonged to my grandparents. Uh, and then we moved upgraded to a four room sharecropper shack that those images are still so strong that I could write them fresh now. Uh, uh, and the need, the urge to get the hell out and have a better life. Uh, maybe I wouldn't have had that urge so strongly if it hadn't been for my father, who had a domineering mean streak and was a little bit lecherous. Uh, if it hadn't been for the, the strong need to get away from that, then uh, I might not have, uh, because there were good things about living there. Like it was beautiful outside, at least, not inside. But it was beautiful outside, and I had and still have a lot of very loving relatives uh, that uh, uh, would do anything for you, would help out. I have one who bush hogs my land there. I still have the land. Um, and he grazes his cattle <laughs> on some some of the land that I lease. I'm going back uh Next week, on the 15th, the same day my book comes out, to, to uh, play Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies on the back of his truck. He has a float and a parade, the Magnolia Blossom Festival. Um, the same young cousin who's grazing his cows on my land. So the, the, the bonds are still strong. And when I felt guilty for abandoning my mother and sister, who really needed me, um, uh, I, I didn't want to keep going back because of that guilt and the helplessness. Uh, but now that they're gone, uh, I feel those bonds uh, to the relatives and to the land and to the memories. And that's when I realized there would never be a last trip home, uh, that I would keep going back there. And that's why I gave it that title. And I have forgotten what your original question was, Wiener Dick. But, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the answer was. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, my my grandparents uh, uh, raised my dad uh, in in one of those three room sharecropper really? shacks. Yes, yeah. in 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 rural Mississippi, uh, where I'm well, from, and well, there there is this. Uh, this thing about the rural South that a lot of people in other parts of the country cannot appreciate um, how 
how very recent uh, some of that abject poverty and, uh, you know, is to, you know, we, especially if you, if you move out west like you did and, and, you know, you're a very metropolitan, uh, life now, uh, but this, that's a very recent re- memory for a lot of folks in the rural south. Yes, right. I, uh, and, I and, true. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and those, uh, those kinds of stories that that, type of upbringing and and being uh you know that there's a, a lot of bad to it uh but you know i think it really um those types of circumstances really encourage storytelling uh because you well for one uh people want to entertain themselves and think of of uh of something better than where they are now uh but then just being close to everybody and not having anything else to do uh, but to sit and talk and, and tell stories. Uh, do, do you feel like that that rural southern upbringing uh, is, was ripe uh, for storytelling for you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I see some of the younger uh, relatives on Facebook, and they have something they call the snipe. Salem Snipe Shenanigans on Facebook, and they video uh, stories about uh, the olden days, their olden days, which uh, would be recent for me. But uh, right. uh, So, yes, that, that urge is definitely there. But a part of what motivated me and made me not uh, as much like them and unsuitable for that life is that, that – I wasn't any good at it. I wasn't any good at being a farm girl. I threw up when I milked the cow, and I didn't like getting my hands dirty, so picking cotton and and shelling butter beans and all of that was unpleasant for me. So I wanted to do something else for the rest of my life. I didn't want to, and I didn't want to be bad at something. Uh, So uh, I wanted, that was a part of my motive. Uh, but then the memories were so strong and so closely related to my mother and my sister, whom I loved, that uh, that motivated me to write the stories too. So, so what brought what brought about this uh, uh, this book, Last Trip Home? You, uh, where did the the idea for for this particular story? When did it start coming to you, and how did you decide to start getting it written down? Well, I was in a writing group, uh, and I used it as a catharsis so that it was, it was really a psychological release for me to write the stories and have, and read them and have other writers accept them and not, uh, uh, stone me or vomit. Uh, so that encouraged me. Uh, their liking the stories encouraged me. Uh, and, and I, well, I, and, it wasn't the first book I wrote. This is my fifth book. Uh, I've actually written 14 books, if you count two of my textbooks that went into five editions. I, In the publishing talk that I recently gave, I spread them all out, the different books, and I'd never actually counted them all before because two of them did go into five editions. And I was stunned that I had written 14 books, and I taught full-time college uh, English. Uh, so um, I had to write this book and polish it and cut it and edit it over a really long period of time. Um, and at some point, I had so much written. Well, I needed to get it out of my files, but uh, I needed to do something with it. Uh, uh, I needed to have a physical book. So I started cutting, cutting a lot and editing and polishing. Uh, and then I, I started. Other books that I, I published were all traditional publishers, but I wasn't able to get one for this. Publishing has changed so much, or an agent. Uh, so I was finally able to get it accepted by She Writes Press, which is a hybrid press, very much like my book. I fictionalized parts of my book to partly to make it more interesting and tighter and partly to protect people who are living. Right. Right. Um, talking about publishing changing, um, it, it has really changed over the last few years and, and the hybrid model 
you know, is, uh, is those those hybrid publishers are really doing some interesting stuff now at helping people to to find an audience and, and helping them to do uh, the the indie publishing stuff, uh, but without having to do it all yourself, uh, which is which is pretty neat and helping a lot of people get their stories out that might not have gotten out otherwise. Right, right. The only part about it, well, of course, the editing was a problem because uh, since I was an English teacher, I felt I knew more than the editor, so I argued <laughs> every point of the way. <laughs> and also what to call it was a bit of a problem. I started calling it an autobiographical novel because I knew I had fictionalized parts of it. Uh, but uh, the uh, publisher, She Writes Press, wanted to call it a memoir. We finally compromised on Story of an Arkansas Farm Girl. Uh, but and I forgot uh, Wiener Dick. The point I was going to make about this. Um, what was your original question? Yeah, well, I was just talking about the the way that publishing has changed and oh, that that yeah. hybrid publishing is allowing people to get stories out. Oh, I remember what it was going to say. It had nothing to do with your question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was it's important to me that <clears throat> the part that I can cannot bear is pimping the book being I've never had to sell it myself uh, but when I was going through my files to research this publication talk I found a letter I had written to Addison Wesley Longman uh, the last who did the last edition of the textbook and I <clears throat> complained about being asked to write a Dear Professor story. So it was beginning to change, even in traditional, back in the 90s. Mid, it was the mid-90s, I think, that I wrote this letter. Uh, and they were beginning to expect authors to uh, do some of the selling. So uh, I felt a little bit less virtuous <laughs> and indignant about having to sell my book because the traditional publishers were doing it too. That was a revelation. Oh, and, and today, uh, it doesn't matter if you're tra traditionally published, indie published, or hybrid, uh, you have to sell the book. Uh, yes. the, the yes. biggest names with, uh, with traditional publishers are out pimping their book constantly. And it's a, it, it really, uh, it, it's a different landscape now. It is. It is. I mean, I find myself on the tennis court afterwards selling my book out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. That's yes. embarrassing. <laughs> but it gives me something to post on Facebook. That's I have right. To take a picture of me and then I complain about it on, on Facebook. <laughs> what to call me. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, let's talk about the uh, the book itself. You, you said it's a it's a fictionalized memoir or uh, right. a true novel or some hybrid mix of the I two. I call it a mem novel. A mem a novel. I like that. <laughs> um, your your main character, Grace Marie. Um, yes. Who who is she, and and how did you decide on what part of her story to tell? Uh, Grace Marie is I. I am Grace May, uh, and as my relatives would call her, Grace Marie. I got that name from a friend, and uh, she is as accurate as I could get her. I didn't have to protect myself. It was more living people that I tried to protect, uh, and my immediate family was as close to the real people as I could get them. Since my brother is still alive, I didn't portray him as an adult. I just portrayed him up until about 18 when he left home, uh, when my daddy hit him with a tire iron for not looking for a cow all night. Uh, so um, that part in the, in the dialogue is as close to how I remember it as possible. Uh, the parts I fictionalize were just things to tighten the story a bit or to make it more a little bit more alive. Uh, and I probably shouldn't say this, but at the end of the book, for example, uh, that would be the biggest part that I fictionalize. Uh, it just seemed that the readers ought to have a little satisfaction after reading all that grim stuff. Um, but when I burned down the sharecropper shack, um, I didn't go back for that. The, uh, the fire department burned it down, and my cousin was there, and he described it to me, uh, and I taped his describing it to me. But uh, in the book, 
I had myself going back and I had the kinds of conversations with people that I would have had if I'd gone back or that I'd had at other times, like with my Aunt Desser. Uh, she was such a wonderful person and character that I made her pretty close to uh, who she was uh, and um, the conversations that we had about uh, uh, me being stubborn and her bringing food to eat those that happened at other times uh, so that's what I mean by that blend and I had my brother come back that was the biggest fiction uh, just for some satisfaction there but he never did come back because he was so traumatized by what ha- what the things that happened to him. Perhaps more than I. Mo, in, in telling a story like this, uh, where we we're portraying true events, uh, but we have the liberty to change some of the outcomes, uh, like like your brother, for instance. Um, what do you do? You think that that this is um, uh, a cathartic thing for you uh, to uh, to kind of uh, relive some of those memories, and uh, what do you think that that uh, does for the reader? Um, I, I guess what I'm asking is what what do you hope that readers take away from this story, and um, do you think that in in writing it like this, you get to inject some hope where there was no hope? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, the idea of sticking to your guns and working hard and uh, to get what you want and, ha- and still have some compassion for other people. I do think people get that message. And, of course, I want them to admire me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've gotten good feedback so far. Uh, I have a friend uh, that, gosh, I met her on the tennis court 30 years ago, who's a poet, Linda Neal, and she read my book and wrote a poem about me that I'll probably be posting on my blog uh, in a, maybe in a few days, but you should read it. It's wonderful. The, the fact that, uh, that this city girl, this sophisticated, educated city girl would have been affected by my book that much uh, touched me so much that I actually got moisture in my eyes, uh, it, uh, which is rare. Uh, and I, I've been getting positive reactions from the Arkansas kinfolk so far. There is a branch of the family, my mother's side, that I have a that there's been an ominous silence. And I think that might be because I used the McClure name. At first I had I had used a, a, a fake name. And at the last minute, because of my murdering pedophile great grandfather and the Me Too movement, I decided fuck it. I'm going to use his real name and use the newspaper clipping from the Arkansas Gazette about the murder and about his arrest. And I know he did such damage to my female relatives that I wanted to portray him accurately and I wanted to use his real name. But of course, there are still McClure's in that area, in that small town. I'm a little afraid that it's going to embarrass them. And, uh, so I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the granny float, you know, playing granny. Uh, maybe I'll get shot off it. <laughs> I did it. So, <laughs> well, well, you know, we all of our families have something back there that we're not proud of, and uh, but you know, bringing that stuff into the light of day uh, hopefully brings about some healing. Uh, because you know, if we you can't heal something that's just covered over all the time. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. They should be proud that they survived it. Exactly. Exactly. That that's where the pride should be, not in it covering up something that that we just want to pretend didn't happen. Yes, and it used yeah. to be because the man was the head of the household and he was the breadwinner and the or the one who killed the squirrels and brought the men to fry that uh it used to be that we protected them. Right. But right. That's not as necessary anymore. Sure, sure. Um, I, I appreciate that you uh, mentioned your friend who was a, a city girl, uh, but the story connected with her. Um, do, do you feel like that these kinds of stories uh, that are about about very specific places, very specific times, uh, 
why do you think other people that don't have a connection to that time and place, why do you think these stories connect with them uh, so deeply? Is it because we we have this need to, um, to, to find out about each other and where we come from? Uh, is it just the, the human condition is the same no matter where you're from? Yes, yeah, some of it is that. Some of it is like they're visiting a foreign country when they my they read my book and they're shocked that I was raised that way. Uh, but I, I just had a lunch with uh, uh, some tennis friends, my old Tuesday tennis tarts, I call them. And <laughs> they brought their books in uh, and uh, they questioned me and the kinds of questions they ask. Uh, about how I felt and what happened here. And then they started to tell their stories and they weren't like mine, but it, they were human, you know, they were human and there were things that, t- so that part is we have in common. There were things that traumatized them. And uh, so, yes, there's some of both of the foreign country, like it, you're reading a historical novel. Uh, and part of it is that people are still people. Women are still women. Um, Mo, the, uh, the book is called Last Trip Home. It's available now uh, as people are listening to this. Um, we, we mentioned your blog uh, a minute ago. Where else can people find you online uh, if they want to connect with you and your work? Well, uh, are you on I, Facebook I, or Twitter? Yes. The only thing I'm really active on is Facebook. I'm on Twitter, but I actually got on Twitter to kind of snoop on my granddaughter. Uh, I don't. I never post, but I'm going to try to a, a bit more. I finally got my my website connected to uh, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, my publisher, I think, connected all of it to my publisher. I can't really explain it. I don't understand it, but uh, that's the best I can do <laughs> with with what I have left in my poor uh, old Alzheimer-ridden brain. Well, uh, Mo, I, uh, I wish you much success on this book, and uh, we're going to send as many people to go pick up a copy of it as we can. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Hank, so much for being understanding and asking the right questions <laughs> <laughs> and for helping me pimp my book. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. You took a terrible risk tonight. Why? You don't know? The first rule. I was told by a friend that I shouldn't reveal my gift to anyone who doesn't have a gift themselves. That's exactly right. Because everyone we tell dies. Yes. You might have marked me for death made you a target for a ghost. Why can't people know what we can do? What makes it so dangerous? Valerie took up the fireplace prongs and stabbed the logs. It's called the Great Curse. Sparks exploded from glowing crevices and drizzled upwards, ricocheting off the black belly of the cauldron, turning into tiny ashes that disappeared up the chimney. It was cast by... A powerful witch, over three hundred years ago. Witch? Sorry, but witch? Please, there's no such thing. Valerie closed her eyes. A spoon leapt from Jason's dish and caught him in the temple. He wiped melted ice cream from his cheek. You were saying? She cast the curse to stop the witch trials. In Salem? Jason searched his memory. 1690... 1692. They burned her alive in the Salem Common. The only witch to be burned. The cauldron smoked slightly. Its contents had evaporated. A sharp, charred scent filled the room. Wait, said Jason. There were no witches. They were just, I don't know, victims of religious hysteria, right? So you're saying the witch trials were justified? Justified? So if a witch did exist, it would be okay to kill her? No, I just thought... You're right, never mind. 
There was one witch in Salem, at least. A woman with a powerful gift. She only wanted to protect people like us. To give the gifted their anonymity, refuge. She cast the great curse as she burned. She proclaimed that mortals who know a witch shall know death. And that is the great curse. And it's still in effect after all this time. Mortal, as in non-gifted. No mortal can know about you, about any authentic witch. Jason winced. Isn't there another word besides that? She shrugged. So no one can know what I am, what I can do, or else they become a target. Right. The spirit world will obey the great curse and try to kill them. The spirit world. The other realm. Jason rubbed his eyes. How much of this was reality and how much of this was Valerie's nutty brand of mysticism? He felt himself pulling back, as usual, for fear of contagion. He'd spent his whole life reading science fiction. He hated paranormal tales. This was... this was... not his genre. <laughs>